Hi, this is a video about overcoming fears and phobias. And in this talk, you're going to learn a bit about fears and phobias, basically why we have phobias, why we have fears, why we have a fascination of fear, and most importantly, how to go from a state of anxiety and the horrible feeling you get when you have a phobia to a place where that phobia can be completely eliminated. Uh, my name is Adam Cox and I am a clinical hypnotherapist based in Harley Street, um, which is the uh, premier location within the UK to treat people, which is why I'm known for treating uh, celebrities, CEOs, and the people that are highly motivated to resolve their fear. My brand is Phobia Guru, and this is a brand that was gifted to me by clients and the media. And before I adopted the Phobia Guru brand, I had to ask myself the question, you know, do I have any irrational fears left? Because as a teenager, in my late teenage years, I reached a point where I had so many anxieties, so many fears, that it was very debilitating. It was crippling my ability to do anything. So in my first year of university, uh, having left home for the first time, 18 years old, I was in a small bedsit apartment and... A couple of things happened which knocked my confidence. So the first thing is that um, a, a tooth that I had um, broke, my front tooth, uh, which meant I avoided um, going to certain social situations and, and environments until that tooth was repaired. And because it was the winter months, my skin developed a bit of a, a red rash on my face. Uh, and a combination of these two things really meant that I avoided um, social situations, avoided um, people. And what I found is that that gave me too much thinking time to dwell on how I felt about certain things. And, and really what it meant is that what started off as a low level of anxiety rapidly increased to a feeling of um, complete panic at the idea of going anywhere, doing anything. So although I had a couple of phobias at that point, I had a fear of public speaking and I also had a fear of heights. Um, what really became debilitating for me was this feeling of social anxiety that I couldn't actually be around groups of people. So I avoided going to my courses at university. I avoided going to any kind of um, parties and anything like that and, and essentially became a recluse and what started off as this kind of avoiding of people suddenly became anxiety about anything so this term general anxiety disorder really became something that um, was stopping me from doing pretty much anything um, to the extent that I would only leave the apartment um, after dark go straight to the supermarket to get food take that food straight back in my bedsit apartment and just spend hours after hours distracting myself watching television. You know, not a good existence. Uh, and it reached a point where, for me, I had to explore the different ways of actually dealing with anxiety because it occurred to me that I had two different futures and I was only 18 years old at this point and I was essentially crippled by anxiety and a complete recluse. Now one future was a future where I spent my life being, you know, a victim of anxiety and would allow these phobias, these fears to control my life. And the second future was that I would have to figure out how to solve these problems. I would have to learn from who has got through this before. And it really meant that I went on a journey of learning everything I could about fears, about anxieties, about phobias. And that enabled me um, over the next two or three years to one by one get through each and every one of my fears and phobias, or so I thought. 
But at the point where I took these skills, and, and essentially I was my first client, um, and started working with you know quite high profile people, getting rid of their phobias very, very quickly, the media started giving me this term of the, the phobia guru. Uh, and so I asked myself the question, you know, before I adopt this as my own brand, do I have any irrational fears left? And occasionally I'd gone to some stand-up comedy shows and I would always have this kind of feeling of, right, avoid the front rows just in case, you know, I have to interact with a, a, a comedian on the stage. But the idea of actually being on the stage in front of an audience doing something um, like what they were doing terrified me. And I thought, this is my final irrational fear, this kind of idea of doing stand-up comedy. So I set myself a challenge. I said, before I adopt the brand Phobia Guru, um, I have to confront this final fear. I have to do stand-up comedy, not just once, but to the point where I can do it completely free of, of fear. So I did that. I did a, um, a stand-up comedy course because I thought I'm not going to go straight on, on a stage. I'll learn the basics. And my first performance was to an audience of about 100 people in a, in a bar in the east end of London. And I managed to get through that five minutes. And I say get through because I didn't do it with high levels of, of confidence. You know, I still had anxiety. I still had... Um, adrenaline going through but I managed to do it and over the next six to twelve months I probably did about 20 more stand-up comedy performances until it got to a point where there was just no fear whatsoever um, and that's when I adopted the phobia guru brand so although I was working with clients uh, tackling phobias up to that point it was really after that point where I embraced the the label of phobia guru because I thought you know, I've done something that I never thought I would be able to do. And I'll talk you through in this video the approaches that I applied on myself and that I've worked with with hundreds of other people over the years to make them free of their phobias. Um, in addition to being a Harley Street hypnotherapist uh, and a phobia specialist, I'm also a radio presenter on a radio station called Share Radio. And unsurprisingly, uh, my show is about the psychology of um, money and finance and things like that. The show is called Modern Mindset. Um, so if you either go to the Share Radio website or if you put Modern Mindset in uh, in Google, you'll see my radio show come up. And I'm also a speaker for funding. So regularly I talk to um, audiences of anything from, you know, 30, 40, 50, up to hundreds. Uh, and this is one of my talks. Um, so what I've essentially done is I've created vid a video, this video, based on the talks that tend to last a bit longer because there's a lot more interaction, questions going back and forth. So this is a condensed version of what's essentially a 90-minute talk um, that I do for people. So hopefully this video is useful to give you a bit of an insight in terms of um, what fears are, what phobias are, what anxieties are, and crucially, how do you get rid of them? So part of why um, I'm so well known as a phobia expert is because the media tend to come to me if they want to talk to someone um, about phobias. Um, so although this um, page here is a glimpse of the kind of things that um, you know I, I get featured in terms of major newspapers, magazines, websites, um, you know things like that, like uh, radio stations, for example, TV channels. Um, I'm also um, regularly featured in, in all kinds of media. So essentially, and, and the reason why this came about, by the way, is because um, I am very passionate about sharing um, this idea that phobias are optional, that you don't have to have a phobia if you don't want it. And because I've successfully done that with hundreds of people, um, and I've got lots of testimonials and things like that, the media are very interested to, in speaking to me about what phobias are, why people have phobias, but most importantly, how can people get rid of phobias that they don't want? So what we're going to discover in this video, first and foremost, what is fear? Um, 
why we have a fascination of fear, which we do, by the way. Um, the biology of fear, you know, fear itself is subjective, but the symptoms of fear are very much um, biological in nature, and you'll learn why. Um, and, and the other thing is, people talk about phobias as being an irrational fear. Um, not the way I see it. Phobias are very rational. Um, they're just not very useful. And I'll talk about why we have them. And I'm going to end this video with how to overcome fears and phobias. And, and I'm going to leave you with a final thought at the end of the video in terms of what it means when you can actually get rid of even just one phobia. You're only born with a couple of fears, and these are the fear of um, falling and the fear of loud noises. Normally when I do the talks, I play a video here, so um, th the sound probably won't come through, um, but there there should be, no, there, that's not come through. But there is um, a video there um, of someone doing um, things like handstands and jumps on the edge of a skyscraper at a very, very high distance. And the, and the point I'm making with that video is that even though we are born with fears, like the fear of falling, even those fears that we're born with can be overruled. You can learn and change those fears with a different uh, response. So what is fear? You know, I've talked a lot about fears, phobias, anxieties, but what is fear? The definition of fear is that it is an unpleasant emotion caused by the threat of danger, pain, or harm. Okay, I would add a word there, and that is that fear is an unpleasant emotion caused by the perceived threat of danger, pain, or harm. And by the way, that doesn't have to be physical danger, pain, or harm. That could be embarrassment. That could be um, the thought of overwhelm or not coping. And these are important distinctions to make, as you'll learn in the rest of this video. Um, fear is also a survival function. Our brains have evolved not for happiness, but for survival. And as a species, if we didn't have our biological reaction to fear, we may not exist as a species. You know, it's that important. And if you think about it, I want you to, you know, think back um, to your ancestors, hunter-gatherers, perhaps living in a cave or, you know, in some kind of a tribe. And back then, before proper civilization existed, um, we were not only predators, but we were prey. And there might have been animals around at that time that could more mortally kill us. You know, we, we could be at risk of death as a result of these things. And therefore, having a very quick reaction, biological reaction to a perceived threat that would give us the ability to run faster, um, fight off a predator, um, and temporarily not even experience pain while that's happening could enable us to survive. And although it feels odd to have that same biological reaction if you're just looking at, let's say, a bird or a clown or the idea of going on a flight or public speaking, the biological nature of why you experience that has come from evolution. You know, so it's difficult for us to be too critical of that process when there's a high probability that that very process is one of the reasons that we even exist. So that's what fear is. You know, it's a, a process of managing some kind of perceived threat, danger, pain or harm. But how do we actually cope with fear? Now, this is the interesting thing because... Um, the number one way that we cope with fear, and I say cope loosely, is avoidance. Okay, and this makes sense. This makes sense in a lot of cases. If we, um, let's say, are afraid of a particular animal, let's say in the wild, uh, and the animal might be, let's say, some kind of um, 
you know, big cat, lion, tiger, panther, something like that. And we knew where that cat lived. Okay, it's in certain kind of places. Then avoiding those places is a really good way to survive. You know, thinking back to your ancestors. Um, so avoidance can work in many cases. And I was on TV once um, just after the uh, film, uh, the remake of the film It by Stephen King uh, came out. And obviously Pennywise the Clown is is featured in this particular uh, film. And therefore they got in contact with me to talk about coulrophobia, the fear of clowns. And one of the things I, I actually said um, on TV is that, you know, I don't work with that many people with a fear of clowns. And the reason for that are that clowns are relatively easy to avoid. You know, if you have even a an intense 10 out of 10, 9 out of 10 anxiety reaction to clowns, there are ways that you can manage that. You can manage that by simply not going to circuses, you know, not uh, watching scary clown-based movies, you know, and occasionally there might be, you know, someone dressed as a clown, you know, on Halloween or, you know, on a high street or something like that, but they're very easy to avoid. You can just walk away from them. So this element of using avoidance to cope with fear can work as a strategy. Um, it has problems, but it can work. And, and the reason why many people choose to work with me is because avoidance is no longer an effective strategy for them. Um, for example, if you have a fear of flying or a fear of public transport, but let's say your relatives live in a different part of the world and you need to fly to them, or let's say that you avoid public transport because it creates an anxiety response and you change job or you change career and therefore you need to use public transport, then avoidance is no longer an effective strategy. You know, your, your, the reality of your circumstances is colliding with what you've been doing before to cope with that, which is no longer an effective strategy. Um, and there are certain things that you can't avoid. You know, for those people that um, have arachnophobia, for example, this uh, fear of spiders, uh, cynophobia, fear of dogs, um, then you can't really constantly evolve them because there are so many of them. And actually, uh, with spiders, even when people, you know, kind of um, block up holes in, in, in kind of under doors and things like that and have the tape and things, spiders will always get in. So sometimes avoidance just doesn't work as a strategy. Um, it's also an interesting thing that avoidance um, can increase the intensity and prevalence of the fear. And later on in this video, I'll explain why. How else do we cope with fear? Well, we can cope with fear um, by actually experiencing anxiety. Now, you might not think of anxiety or even panic, a more intense form of anxiety, as a coping strategy. But your unconscious mind is doing that. You know, it's it's saying, well, like, you don't have the resources to, to manage this situation. So I'm going to flood your body with all of these um, essentially drugs, you know, these neurotransmitters, um, like adrenaline, for example, so that perhaps you'll cope. And it's a very primal, basic reaction, um, but it is designed as a biological coping strategy. Um, another way that people cope with fear and anxiety is self-medication. Now, the self-medication can be things like uh, alcohol, for example. So uh, I think most people have heard of this phrase, Dutch courage, um, simply drinking your way through uh, an anxious situation. Uh, many people will use food. Um, and the reason for that is that we tend to experience the feeling of anxiety um, in, in, the, in the gut, you know, just below the solar plexus. Now, the thing is, when you eat, um, because your food passes through your stomach into your digestive system, um, it changes your focus and it also changes the biology um, in order to digest. 
So it kind of works as a temporary form of distraction. Um, so self-medication, alcohol, food, and occasionally, um, not even self-medication, but medication via doctors. So if you went to a general practitioner, for example, and you described the symptoms of your anxiety, it's likely that the doctor will prescribe either an antidepressant, and I've had several clients that have been prescribed those simply because the doctors don't know what to do, or beta blockers. Um, and this is not treating the cause, not really helping in any way, but it's symptom management. It's giving some type of medication that means that the severity of the symptoms are not quite so um, intense. So self-medication or even external medication is, is a way that people can choose to cope with fear, anxiety, and, and phobias. They all have their downsides. Um, and, and I would also say um, another way that people can um, cope with fear um, is distraction. Um, and, and one of the popular ways of distracting is things like excessive TV watching, excessive time on social media. Um, if people feel ang anxious, they tend to go to something that will shift their focus temporarily. Um, so if any of these things are ringing true with you, just know that they may work temporarily, but they are not a solution to the fear, anxiety, or a phobia. Um, and that at the end of this video, you will actually learn what does actually work because all of these are coping strategies, not solutions. So we as a, as a species, as humans, have a fascination of fear. Um, for example, some of the most popular genres of movies tend to be horror movies, gangster movies, violent movies, action movies. And many of the themes in this is some kind of threat, danger, um, you know, it could be in, involve murders or some kind of killer or a representative. Quite often the antagonist is some kind of threat or monster uh, and they are putting the protagonist at risk in some way. So we have a fascination of fear even if we're experiencing that through the perception of other people. And, you know... Um, Something that's been very helpful for my career as a phobia specialist is every now and then movies come out um, that involve something that preys on our inherent um, stereotypes of fears. So if you think about movies like Arachnophobia, Jaws, um, you know, and, and I think there was one recently with Jason Statham about, you know, the uh, Megalodon, I think it was called The Meg, um, and it, it did successfully, you know, very well uh, in the box office because uh, essentially it was like a shark but much bigger. So we have these kind of uh, movies that are created um, that are allude to things that we are frightened of. And the reason why the uh, companies, the, the movie companies keep making them is because of that fascination. You know, we, we like to see them. There are... Um, institutions like theme parks um, that basically have things that temporarily give us the experience of fear. Roller coasters, for example, lots of fair, fairground rides and um, you know theme park rides have this element of perceived danger. And, and it's quite interesting how they prime you to experience or, or manage your expectations in a certain way. So certain, certain, there will be certain themes, for example, or the name of the ride will have some kind of, um, you know, kind of hint of some type of danger or threat in some way. Uh, and yet, we love them. You know, we, we love this kind of experience because it's kind of, it has an element of fear, but there's also the perception of safety because you start psychologically evaluating that, well, thousands of people have been on this ride, therefore it can't be that dangerous. But we kind of like this idea of danger anyway. Adrenaline sports. Now, whether that's skydiving, bungee jumping, you know, and, and the list is growing. Um, but these kind of sports are 
growing massively in popularity, partly down to um, the, the, the kind of portable videos. So things like GoPro, for example, and head-mounted video is giving people an insight into um, what it would be like to jump off a skyscraper and base jump or, you know, fly... Um, you know, past ravines in a in a wing gliding suit, uh, and these videos are very very popular. Um, there is even you know we talked about this kind of fear of falling, um, a genre of YouTube video where people basically um, break into building sites, climb really tall trains, or they get onto the top of skyscrapers with one of these um, GoPro cameras, just to kind of um, give an insight into this kind of perceived threat or danger uh, and and part of the attraction of why people see these videos is they're thinking you know maybe maybe they're going to fall um so we have this fascination of fear um the the games industry has actually overtaken the movie industry and uh, music industry combined in terms of revenue and if you think about the genres that do very well in gaming um, they tend to involve violence or like one of the the the, the top um you know kind of first person shooters you know will quite often involve zombies you know monsters of some kind or some kind of um threat of uh, an attacking force now whether that's first person shooters or you know kind of avatars and things like that but quite often you get to play the role of being in a situation where there is this perceived threat and increasingly, they're not just through a screen, but sometimes they're through, um, you know, virtual reality headsets or augmented reality headsets. And it's about making those kind of situations as realistic as possible, because what they find is that your biological response to it in terms of raised heart rate and the adrenaline um, increases the more realistic those situations are if that makes sense. So although we can say, right, fear is bad, I don't agree with that, by the way, um, the symptoms can be unpleasant, the emotional feelings can be unpleasant, fear is subjective. And one of the key things that I would say is that whatever it is that you're afraid of is someone else's passion or hobby. Just think about that for a moment. Um, if you're a scare, if you're scared of spiders, for example, someone out there collects, you know, I, I happen to know someone that has a collection of more than 60 tarantulas. Um, if you are afraid of clowns, someone else, as a hobby, dresses up as a clown um, for fun, okay? And there are lots of things like this. If you have a you know a fear of flying, someone else is regularly going up in old jets and, and old airplanes doing loop the loops in the sky. So one person's fear is another person's fun. Um, but overall, the key thing is that fear is subjective. And if fear is subjective, but the symptoms are real, then the key question to ask yourself is, is this fear useful? Do I want to keep having this fear or not? Um, and if you don't, then keep watching this video because you're going to learn that you don't have to have this video, this, this fear anymore. Now, there are lots and lots of surveys and studies on phobias and fears. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, this is just one of them um, of fears, not phobias. There are lots of other surveys on phobias of some of our primal fears. And if we look at this, and, and this is interesting because mortality and the very threat of our existence is behind you know, a lot of these fears that we have. So 41% of us, according to this study, uh, are afraid of illness. Uh, illnesses are unpleasant, undesirable. Interestingly, more people are afraid of um, getting sick than dying, which is an interesting anomaly there. Um, more than a third of us are afraid of death. 31% are afraid of old age. And obviously, statistically, you're more likely to die when you're older. But equally, you're statistically more likely to get sick. So maybe that fear of old age is a combination of those two. 27%, just under a third, are afraid of a terrorist attack. Um, and, and quite often, by the way, um, the terrorist attack is not even the, the, the feeling that someone's going to die in a terrorist attack. 
but just that there is a lot of panic and anxiety in the air. And one of the things I've learned having worked with so many people with fears, anxieties, and phobias is that they're contagious. Um, not in the same way that a disease is, but if you spend too much time around someone very anxious, um, it's certainly possible to adopt some of their anxieties. Um, getting into debt is a big fear for some people. Being burgled, 17% uh, losing their hair. Um, if you've seen any pictures of me, you'll know that's no longer a fear I have. I'm completely bold. 16% uh, losing their job. 13% um, snakes, spiders, dangerous animals, things like that. And 11% partner cheating on you. Now, the interesting thing here is that I've seen hundreds of these studies, and they're all different, you know. But overall, one of the studies that, that really um, seems to have more credibility just by the sample size says that 43% of us have some kind of fear or phobia of some kind um, that we no longer want, okay? You know, so that's not rare. You know, if you think, you know, of the entire population, over four in 10 have some type of phobia um, that they don't want anymore. Kind of gives you an idea that you're not alone. So what are the consequences of fear? There are many, um, and and for a period of time, I was absolutely crippled by um, anxiety. And, and one of the, the key things for me is that there were many things over that period that I just missed out on um, because there's a cause and effect. You know, if you avoid certain things, then you're not given the opportunity to be involved in certain things. So it's likely that there are missed opportunities as a direct result of your fear of your phobia. Poor mental health. Um, you know, for me, I didn't start off with this kind of social anxiety disorder and general anxiety disorder. It started off with just a couple of phobias, you know, a couple of decisions to avoid certain situations. And then before I know it, I'd got myself into a situation where my isolation caused lots of other mental health um, issues as a result of the anxiety. So, you know, the anxiety can cause almost like a, you know, a ripple effect of other things. Um, as a result of that, you know, you start to question your yourself you know, and, you know, if you become isolated or you avoid certain things or you feel distressed or have panic attacks, that can knock your confidence. It can knock your self-esteem. It can lead to depression. You know, if you're agoraphobic and you simply don't leave your house, um, then that increases the, the feeling of helplessness, dependency on other people, which can lead to depression. Um, and as I said before, it's contagious not just bet between people, but also in other fears and anxieties. So if you have a, um, let's say you start off with one fear, um, then you know if you don't get a handle on that, then because you're in this constant state of anxiety, then other things can then trigger um, a similar kind of sensation. So the analogy that I would use is that um, fears are a bit like shadows. And, you know, action is a bit like light. And if you constantly avoid um, things, then, you know, the, the shadows can grow and grow because they're in a dark environment. Um, and, 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 you know, I use a lot of metaphors when I'm working with clients because once they see things in a particular way, then it enables them and empowers them to actually defeat the fear and, and tackle it. Um, consequences of fear. And I think back to my late teens, early 20s, and I think, had I not um, solved those particular fears and phobias, then my life would be very different. Um, now, you know, I'm in a situation, very fortunate situation, where I own several businesses, lots of properties, you know, I, I have a family, you know, there's lots of things I'm very grateful for. And virtually all of those things wouldn't have happened had I not got through this um, period of finding the solution to the fears, anxieties, and phobias. In fact, back then, I had what I now perceive to be a self-made prison. 
because even the idea of opening the door to my uh, bedsit apartment, tiny apartment, had my heart racing. You know, not in a good way, in a in a kind of dread way. Um, the idea of of just meeting someone or being in a social environment, you know, was was like horrible to me, and that meant that I became very isolated. So I'd effectively created uh, a self-made prison. Another consequence of fear, anxieties, and phobias are, you know, actually paradoxically an increase in the danger. You know, and, and back then when I was very anxious and, and avoiding people, it occurs to me that my body language increased my likelihood of being mugged or attacked because I projected this kind of um, person in fear, um, which attackers or muggers would look out for as an opportunity. If you think about, um, let's say, a fear or phobia of uh, insects, for example, like bees and wasps, if the anxiety and the panic means that they start, you know, running around, waving their hands around, that would increase their likelihood of being stung. Um, I had one client, genuine case, where she was driving on a motorway, and while she was driving, you know, around about the speed limit on the motorway, and she had arachnophobia, she had this terrifying fear of, of spiders, and while she was driving, a spider came down from the from the the the, the mirror, um, and all she could look at was the spider, not the road. And of course, her reaction was, you know, this panic reaction, this kind of raised heartbeat, breathing, you know, and she couldn't avoid because she was in a in the driving seat with the seatbelt on. And to, to quote her, she said, like, I, how I managed to get from, you know, that, that kind of fast lane to the, you know, the hard shoulder where she could pull over, she has no idea. She has no idea how she did not um, either kill herself or someone else. And, and she said it would have been, you know, better for her to kill herself than someone else and, and have that on her conscience. So that was a potential consequence of her fear, her phobia. Um, maybe it's that you can't see the world if you've got a fear of flying, you know, you can't enjoy your holidays. Maybe it's that you can't progress in your career if you've got a fear of public speaking. Maybe it's that, you know, you can't, um, get the job or the promotion that you want. You know, there are all these consequences of fear. And if the consequences are there and avoidance doesn't work, um, then it's worth asking yourself the question, do I really want to have this fear anymore? And if the answer is no, um, then keep watching the video because you're going to learn exactly how to get rid of these um, fears that you don't want. Uh, this is a meme. Um, there was a spider. I panicked, but I think it's gone now. And, and although this is, of course, is, is meant to be a funny meme, um, it does represent something uh, a bit more serious. And I've had at least two people. I mean, I, I'm the hypnotherapist for... Um, a spider workshop um, we tend to do once a month in in London um, and at least two people have told me that they've used the uh, the lighter and the hairspray as almost like a handmade flamethrower to kill a spider so they didn't have to deal with it um, because they didn't want to get any kind of proximity to it now you know there have been cases if you look you know just kind of go into Google and, and kind of you know, house burning down because of spider. There have been cases where people have burnt down sheds, garages, and even their homes um, as a as a coping mechanism to try and deal with it. So, as as humorous as this meme is meant to be, there is an element of truth to it. Now, this is talking about the biology of fear, um, and the key thing is is that although people perceive fear and anxiety to be, you know, annoying um, and frustrating and and all these things. It really has a um, a purpose behind it. And you're probably thinking about the fears that you don't want, you know, the phobia that you have that you don't want anymore. You're probably not thinking about it that, you know, intuitively you avoid running out into traffic. You know, you avoid um, walking to the edge of cliffs, you know, and things like that. So things that could be a genuine threat to your health, these feelings that you get are quite useful in certain context. 
Now, there are two main phobias or categories of phobias. You have a simple phobia and you have a situational phobia. Um, and, and in broad terms, a simple phobia follows what you can see on the screen here as the low road, whereas a situational phobia would follow the high road. Okay, so there's an element of evaluation, and I'll give you examples. So a simple phobia that would follow the low road might be arachnophobia, for example, or it might be uh, a fear of cats, dogs, certain insects, whatever it might be. There is the stimulus, you see the thing, or even imagine the thing, um, and then this sensory uh, thalamus um, processes that immediately to the amygdala, and almost like a reflex, the amygdala communicates through neural pathways with the hippocampus, and then you have an emotional response. Now, that emotional response could be anything from, you know, and, and as, as psychologists and hypnotherapists, we use a scale called the subjective unit of distress. So we tend to ask people, because it's subjective, on a scale of one to 10, how intense is the fear and the anxiety? So let's say it's a low level fear. It might You might see something, and if it's far away, for example, that might be a level three or four, and if it's closer and moving towards you and you can't get away, it might be eight, nine, 10, for example. But that's a simple phobia. A situational phobia, and, and a couple of the most popular um, situational phobias tend to be things like um, fear of public speaking or a fear of flying. And, and, and fear of public speaking is a fear that I experienced myself. Now, the point is here, you can't simply see a stage and feel anxious, you know, because if you're, sim if you're watching someone else talk, you won't have that fear. So it can't follow the low road. It requires an element of evaluation. Now, if you're evaluating, um, let's say, the topic, how much time you've had to prepare, um, the audience is very important, um, how big the audience is, um, this evaluation could either reduce or increase the intensity of the uh, emotional response that you experience. So for example, if you were public speaking to a very small audience on a topic that you knew really well, and part of that audience were very friendly people that you got on well with, then the anxiety levels, the emotional response might be low, maybe two, three, four out of 10. If, however, you were um, surprised, let's say someone else was due to speak, they were, they were sick, <clears throat> you now then had very short notice to prepare for a speech on a topic that you weren't that prepared in to an audience of a, of a large audience, many of which were your peers or uh, are influential people in your industry, let's say, you might evaluate that and, and have, let's say, a 7, 8, 9, or even 10 out of 10 reaction you might have a high level of intensity of emotional response. So there's this neural circuitry that takes place really quickly. So quickly, in fact, that you don't have the time to decide if you want it or not. You know, you don't get to choose, you know, how much adrenaline goes through your, your blood. It happens. And it happens very, very quickly. And it happens at the unconscious level. And sometimes people will try and have, let's say, logical, conscious uh, interaction. And they'll say things like, oh, nothing to worry about, you know, but it, but it doesn't really work because it's already gone through this post process. And if you're feeling that your breathing rate is different or your heart rate's increased or you're feeling shivers or colds or shaking, you know, some people, they will um, start crying, for example, or tearing up or their throat, go, uh, throat goes very dry. If these things are happening without your um, conscious involvement, then at that point it can spiral and, and potentially get to a state of panic um, depending on how you perceive these symptoms. And by the way, the, the, the feeling that people get that they label anxiety, other people out there are labeling as excitement, okay? So when you're, and, and this is why they call them adrenaline junkies, you know, because th those feelings that you're labeling as horrible, someone else is labeling them as amazing, you know, because um, the, the next part of this video is that I'll, I'll say actually what's happening in your blood, 
you know, which for some people makes them feel awful and for other people makes them feel alive and amazing. Um, and, and this is where the um, association element comes into because at some level we always process um, what does this mean to us and what do we do next? And if it means something that represents fun and excitement, then what we do next is we try and do it again. You know, I've, I've seen people come off a an intense theme park ride um, and they're, they're kind of laughing at themselves because of how they're feeling and they're running around again to join the queue to do it again. And then other people, they're shaking their head saying, I'm never going to do that again. You know, so um, the same thing is causing different emotions depending on the association or the meaning that we give it. So the biology of fear, so, you know, this this kind of drug called adrenaline, uh, also known as epinephrine, um, and, and, and its sister a neurotransmitter as well, neuro, uh, neuroepinephrine, um, is basically combined the fight or flight response. Okay, this is the thing that we would have used, our ancestors would have used to... Um, run away from or fight off let's say a saber-toothed tiger or some kind of wolf or something like that um, and it's useful it's useful because it raises the heart rate raises your breathing rate and when you've got this going through you're not thinking or feeling pain in that particular moment okay so it's really useful um, I, I remember seeing a um, a video of I think it was John Jones in a, uh, a UFC MMA fight he had won the fight um, and completely hadn't realized that he'd broken his toe and it was kind of it was in a weird angle you know and he hadn't realized because there was that much adrenaline going through his his blood um, so it, it serves a purpose it serves a purpose um, within these kind of life or death situations or what your brain perceives to be the equivalent of a life or death situation. And many people that have a fear of flying, um, you know, think of it in a particular way and ask themselves certain questions that make them feel that, you know, being on a plane that high up is a life or death situation. Um, or it might be, you know, if someone's about to um, do a, a speech, so public speaking, then they start thinking that, um, that could be life or death for their career. Um, and, and, and it's the evaluation that increases the intensity that means that this biological response takes place when the, um, you know, essentially the, the, the um, hippocampus, the amygdala communicating with each other, um, it's the beliefs, the perceptions, the associations that you have alongside the inner self-talk and images quite often movies that we play to ourselves inside our own head that can create this threshold moment where suddenly the flood gets floodgates get opened and you get a lot of these kind of drugs inside you also get this feeling of uh, or dopamine now dopamine is basically the feel good um you know kind of reward um drug inside the brain um and you get little bits of dopamine whenever you do something um, that you quite like in a, in a weird way um, so that could be anything from putting a social media post out there and if you get lots of likes or comments that kind of feels quite good so you want to do it again and again watching a tv show um, going for a run you know things things that make you feel um, like they're worthy in some way give you a little boost of dopamine um, and this is why when I do these workshops where people arrive with a crippling fear of whatever it is, and, and many times it's spiders, at the end they are just beaming from ear to ear with a big smile and they can't wait until they find a spider in their own house because it feels so good. And that's a combination, if you look at the, uh, the bottom of the page there, the serotonin and the dopamine, um, they feel proud of themselves. They feel that they are in control after what could be more than decades or years of feeling that they are the victim of whatever their their particular fear or phobia is uh, glutamate um, is the neurotransmitter responsible for excitement um, and as i would say 
Um, I, I remember I had a fear of heights and, and the way that I tackled that is using a lot of the techniques I'm going to talk about shortly. Um, but I, I like setting myself challenges to prove that I'm well and truly through that fear. And I did a skydive. And the first time I did the skydive, um, I had all this adrenaline going through my blood, you know, and it was a, it was a very intense experience. Um, but for me, I don't like to do anything just once if it's a fear. I like to do it again and again until I can enjoy the process. And after I did that first one, um, you know, I, I remember feeling so exciting, so, so excited, very proud of myself. And then afterwards, about an hour afterwards, I felt really, really tired, you know, and this is the GABA, um, you know, it, it's the calming down element, you know, it's what the body does to try and compensate with all of this stuff going on, all of this dopamine and neuroepinephrine and epinephrine, you know, this, this adrenaline, um, it has to combat that um, to, to kind of get you back down to normality. Because when all this stuff is going uh, on, your brain's racing at a million miles an hour. Um, and, and that's why some people, when they have a very intense fear experience, they, they remember it so vividly because it has an emotional reaction to it and because it's firing up all of these neurotransmitters we're able to capture those memories much more intently we can pay attention to so much more of what's going on um so there's a lot going on and this is why people get addicted um to things and and, and i can certainly put myself in this situation as someone you know 20 years ago that was paralyzed by fear now i look for things you know, if I get a twinge of anxiety or fear, I'm like a moth to a flame. You know, I want to I want to investigate that so I can get rid of it, you know, and, and it becomes addictive. Um, but there are benefits to being addicted to um, facing fears um, in a good way. So we've talked about fears, but what are phobias? And, and phobias really are what what makes them unique and it's not the irrationality it's the fact that they are um persistent you know one of the questions i ask people uh in my in my talks to you know audiences of different size you know raise your hand if you have a phobia okay if they're if they're coming to one of my talks you know they're, they're going to raise their hand and i say right put your hand down if you've ever forgotten to be afraid of that thing that you have a phobia of all the hands are kept raised. And the reason is because you don't forget to have the fear. If anything, it happens the other way around. And there's always a, a few, you know, kind of knowing laughs in the audience when I'm talking to a, a room full of arachnophobes. And I say, look, you know, not only do you not forget to be afraid of spiders, but occasionally that little ball of fluff or the top of a tomato, you've even had a reaction to that. Because the way that the brain works is that even something that isn't that thing but could be that thing still creates this kind of excessive fear and anxiety reaction. And it's not pleasant. This is the crucial thing with phobias. Um, it's distressing in some way. Now, it's, and, and that's the key thing. Although I say, right, the fears are subjective, you know, because whatever your fear is, someone else thinks of it in a different way. The point is, is that your biological and physical reaction to that is unpleasant and that's why you don't want to have it anymore and not only is it unpleasant and persistent um, it generalizes to anything like that it's excessive um, and that's what makes it more narrow than just a fear um, and I was interviewed on radio once about um, a, a new survey and it's all these kind of um, PR stories that they do um, that millennials have a phobia of um, not being able to access Wi-Fi or that their phone would run out of batteries. And I had to explain to the presenter that that's not a phobia. That is a fear of something undesirable happening, but it is not a phobia. Um, you know, and, and, and that's the key thing. A phobia is when something happens at an unconscious level very quickly that creates some kind of distressed anxiety state not of the person's choosing whereas if i see that my my battery is going down on my phone um, that may be unpleasant you know and i want to avoid that but it's certainly not going to create a panic reaction 
um, if that makes sense. So what does the unconscious mind have to do with this? Now, one of the, the tools that I use to help people uh, eliminate their phobias is uh, hypnotherapy. And hypnotherapy is known for making changes at the unconscious level. But to explain really how that works, we need to define what the unconscious even is. Um, and, and the best way that I use to explain what the unconscious mind is is by first explaining what the conscious mind is. And the conscious mind is anything that you are aware of right now. And I think it was Miller in 1957 did a study that is famously called the magic number seven plus or minus two. And what he found is that the short-term memory can only retain about a chunk of seven bits of information. And that's a bit like what's happening all the time in our conscious mind. So you might be aware of my voice right now. You might be uh, aware of the screen that you're watching right now. Um, but there'll be lots happening that you're not aware of. And that might be, you know, some kind of the temperature of the room that you're in, or it might be a noise happening outside a window. There'll be lots happening that you're simply not paying attention to. So what you're aware of consciously is exactly that, what you're aware of which means everything else is in the unconscious mind. And the unconscious mind is the place where um, your skills are. So for example, um, and, and you see this a lot with um, high performing sports people or just people that have reached a certain level of skill. Basket play, basketball players, for example, they can be anywhere on, on, on the, the court and they can know what they need to do they're not thinking consciously about dribbling a ball or what to do it's all happening at the unconscious level it, it's a skill and if you know how to drive a car then you've you know the difference between those first few lessons that you had when everything was conscious you had to actually think right i need to check the mirror i need to change gear i need to press the brake that was all conscious and it was exhausting but you've probably had the experience um after knowing how to drive for you know months or, or even years of having a long journey maybe a journey that you've done before and you virtually did the entire journey without thinking about it you know what started off as you needed to pay attention to everything now you're able to listen to music you know daydream think about stuff and what was conscious is now unconscious so you can do things at the unconscious level your memories are conscious at the very point where you bring them to mind but outside of that they are just in the unconscious mind and the phobias and fears that you have are rooted in either things that happened um you know it could be memories um it could be beliefs that you have it could be um you know distressing times or you know certain images that come to mind um that's all at the unconscious level and what many people do is they try and use self-talk, which is conscious, to influence what's happening at the unconscious level. And it, it doesn't really work that way. Um, you know, I've, I've seen lots of arachnophobes and they say, oh, but I know it's small, you know, and I know it's fragile and, and all this kind of thing. It doesn't help, you know, because the hippocampus and the amygdala at that point have already perceived it, you know, based on routine and repetition and, and the the years that they've been doing this particular pattern um, and it's already got to the point where they're feeling anxious so a lot is happening at the unconscious level and that's where the fear exists so the way that i work with clients is that we we get the fear which is in the unconscious into conscious awareness temporarily so we can change the associations the patterns the sequence of how we experience that anxiety consciously so that when we put it back in the unconscious mind, it's in a different sequence. And I'm going to give you an example here, not of a phobia, but of an unconscious habit that I used to have. As a, as a teenager, I wasn't really a big fan of uh, crisps or sweets or chocolate. But one of the, my favorite foods back as a, as a teenager was apple turnovers. So there's pastry where you've got like an apple sauce in the middle. And... I remember I was about 13 or 14 on holiday, 
biting into this apple turnover. And as I bit into, um, you know, this and I was eating it for, a few, you know, a, a while. But then suddenly I was aware of a crunch, just a, a, a delicate crunch where there shouldn't have been a crunch. It seems strange to me because normally it's, it's soft inside. And I looked in and I could see half a wasp wriggling around in the bit that I hadn't eaten yet. And then it dawned on me. I could feel something moving in my mouth. And at that point, of course, I, I, I spat it out onto the onto the, the grass. I was outside when this happened. Um, and up to that point, I only had positive associations with this apple turnover. And now suddenly I was very conscious of something that I was doing unconsciously. And not only that, but I linked huge amounts of disgust to what previously was pleasurable. And that happened to me when I was about 13, 14 years old. And honestly, I don't think I don't think I've had any more than like one or two since then because I just don't feel like it. It's not that not that I couldn't. It's just and I know intellectually that there are no it's unlikely that there are wasps inside all apple turnovers. But I just don't feel like it anymore. And and that's how quickly change can happen when you take something from the unconscious into the into the conscious and you mess up that pattern so much that it just can't go back to how it was before is it is a clue to the kind of process that I work with when I'm working with clients um, so that um, we can arrive at change quickly and, and and the key thing is it doesn't take weeks or months or years worth of therapy to make a change all it all it takes is knowing which bit of the process to to change so that the sequence can't follow its normal path so phobias as we've seen are a more intense distressing um you know form of of a fear um there's a video here i don't think it's going to play um no it's not um, so we're just going to go to the next bit. So that that was an example there, and and you know probably wise that it didn't play if you have a fear of spiders because there it does feature a tarantula in that in that video. Now, um, this is a useful way of thinking about um, where you are and also where you want to get to. Now the key thing is we don't just experience fears when it comes to our um, phobias or you know anxieties in life we are where we are because there's certain things that we do on a regular basis that we feel comfortable about and the problem is um, in order to grow we have to leave our comfort zone and it's likely that there will require a temporarily small part of discomfort in order for you to get beyond your your fear and phobia um, and I say that because um, I know what I do when I'm working with clients one-on-one -on -one, um, and, and it doesn't involve just doing it, this kind of idea of what's called flooding or um, full desensitization. For me, it's about breaking the pattern, increasing resourcefulness and getting someone into a level where they can do the thing in a safe environment that still represents progress. And if you spend time in the growth zone, then that yellow bit that represents the comfort zone gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And if I use the stand-up comedy example, um, the, the, the first time I decided to do stand-up comedy, if I would have just um, signed up for an open mic night with no practice, no material, that would be me jumping into the danger zone. And that would probably have been a very traumatic, distressing event. Instead, I did a bit of preparation you know, I, I worked with the right kind of people, so I had the basics in place. So when I did that first stand-up comedy uh, routine, um, it wasn't in the danger zone, it was in the growth zone. And by doing that consistently, not only did the comfort zone um, grow, but so did the growth zone. So um, later on, I was able to do stand-up comedy shows at very short notice. Um, without feeling anxious because suddenly although that was out of my comfort zone that then fell within the growth zone 
And the key thing is, is that there is a fine line between being fearless and reckless. And when I'm working with clients, let's say they've got a fear of dogs, I'll say, look, we want to keep a little bit of the fear in place because, you know, most dogs are friendly. Most dogs are lovely, but there are a few dogs that are bred as fighting dogs or guard dogs or that might have been abused by their irresponsible owner throughout their early years that have a different reaction. So you want to keep an element of vigilance so that, you know, if, if I get rid of someone's fear of dogs, what I don't want them to do is to go to the biggest, scariest dog in the park without communicating with their owner and simply patting them on the head. That could be dangerous, okay? What I do want them to do is to experience their fear in a resourceful, safe environment so they can get comfortable and also they can build new references about how to um, experience the stimulus in a way that gives them a new strategy, a new way of testing the new patterns and thought processes that they have. So the reason why I say this is that action is required um, because sometimes people will work with me and, and say, right, well, how do I know if it's worked? And what I say to them is exactly the same question. How will you know if it's worked? What would you have to be able to do in order to prove to yourself that the fear is gone? And this is what I call the convincer strategy. Because if I can then get them to do that thing and manage that thing, even if it's kind of a level three, four, five level of anxiety, it might be unpleasant, but it's tolerable, it's bearable, and they're able to do that thing, then I know that their comfort zone has expanded and their growth zone has expanded, and then they could take on something a bit more challenging. And each and every time they do that, because of this metaphor that they, is programmed into their subconscious mind that fear is like shadows and action is like light, every single time they take action, the fear erodes, the fear erodes, the fear erodes. But it requires that belief system and that metaphor to be installed in the unconscious mind um, in order for them to know how to process what's happening, um, if that makes sense. But the key thing is that a level of action is required in order to finally defeat any fear. Uh, and it comes from uh, this element of a resourceful state called courage. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about this quote here. Courage is not the absence of fear, it's the ability to act in the presence of fear. Um, and, and I'm going to show this bit here because um, this guy wearing the cap um, had a fear of spiders, okay? It took courage. I mean, you'll see there in the in the Perspex box, that's me um, there holding um, a, a spider, a house spider in a Perspex box. It took courage for him because he'd spent almost every year of his waking life worrying about spiders, you know, avoiding spiders. It took courage for him, even after the therapy, to get to the point where he was able to get his hand close to a spider in a Perspex box. And why this is meaningful is that within um, about 10 minutes of doing this, this was a big achievement for him. He was then holding a tarantula. And then 10 minutes after that, he was holding the tarantula again and then even holding a house spider. And at that point, he's like, I am so over this fear. But he had to do something to convince himself that he was over the fear. So action is required. Um, one of the things, I mean, I've... I've talked throughout this video is that you will learn how to get rid of the the fear and and action is one of the things but it's not in isolation so this um tagline this kind of um thing you know whether it's nike um just do it or whether it's um you know feel the fear and do it anyway it has its place but at the right time okay that that's really the key thing so some of the techniques um, that are very effective at actually um, getting rid of phobias uh, are things like hypnotherapy. And, and hypnotherapy is um, one of the key things that I use, um, and it's a very effective way at getting to the root cause of why that fear exists. Um, and, and I should also um, talk about where where phobias come from. Um, and... 
just before I talk about the techniques, the fears, the phobias come from two main sources, okay? And one is learned behavior. Um, so many people learn their phobias from their parents, their siblings, some influential family member um, when they were young. And that sounds like a strange or, you know, almost annoying thing. But equally, you would have learned lots of valuable things from those same people. You will have learned, you know, language, certain beliefs, the values that you have. All the first language that anyone learns is not in a classroom. The first language is just by, you know, immersion and being surrounded by people that already speak that language. Um, so that's the first way that people um, acquire a phobia. The second is a sensitizing event. Uh, and a sensitizing event, I'm going to give you an example here. Because I worked with a, um, a guy that had a um a fear of dogs cynophobia and um i said do you know when this fear came about and he said i can't be sure but i think it's when i was about five years old and the neighbor had a big dog and he from his memory he thought it was a a doberman and he said um i remember one time where i was next to the fence and suddenly, the the dog jumped up at the fence right behind him and started barking loudly, um, you know, in very close proximity. And he said, it freaked me out. I ran away in tears. And since then, you know, I've had this phobia and I just can't understand, can't understand it. And I said to him, look, when you were, when you were five years old, roughly how big were you? You know, and he, he used his hands to show me roughly how big he was when he was five years old. And I said, and when you were five years old, how big would have been the Doberman um, when it was standing up against a fence? And it was about two to three times bigger than he was when he was five years old. Now, just imagine as an adult, if a dog that was two to three times bigger than you unexpectedly suddenly was right next to you, barking loudly you might have a fear reaction as well. So although he didn't understand it, you know, that's what's known as a sensitizing event. Um, and it may be that um, the sensitizing event that you've experienced um, happened when you were very young, or it may have happened when you were older. But what tends to happen is that mind experiences this and then thinks, right, that's something to avoid. That's something I don't like. Therefore, if anything like that happens... I'm going to give you the resources to be able to cope. And then you've got this biological reaction. So that's where the fear comes from. In terms of getting rid of it, hypnotherapy is quite good because you can go back to that very point where the phobia um, was created, the point of inception, and then communicate with the part that is responsible for this phobic response and then communicate with that part in deep trance to see if it's still useful um, to have that particular approach. Um, so I use hypnotherapy and, and many different protocols to tackle that. Um, most hypnotherapists, unfortunately, generalize. So they never acquire the distinctions necessary to get good at any one particular thing. Um, I've worked with approaching 300 um, phobics. Um, so therefore, it's hypnotherapy um, specifically tailored to the issues regarding um, phobias and the structure of phobias by the way are very similar so even if um, you know your phobia is a bit rare you know I've worked with people with a, a fear of balloons a fear of buttons a fear of you know vomit you know you name it I've, I've worked with people but even if I come across someone that I've never experienced an, another client with that particular phobia <clears throat> then I'm still confident that I can help because the structure of phobias is so similar that I know which questions to to kind of ask to get into the root of what is causing their phobia and then we can mess it up and, and one of the ways in which you know you can mess things up um, there's a a protocol or an approach called NLP stands for neurolinguistic programming and one of the, the effective ways there is what's known as the pattern interrupt. Now, the pattern interrupt is that you get someone experiencing what they're experiencing, and then you, just as I did with the, you know, biting into the wasp, that would be an example of a pattern interrupt. 
so you you jolt what would be an automatic process so they can't quite experience it in the same way and there's lots of ways that you can do that so stage dissociation um, things known as the fast phobia cure or the rewind technique you you mess around with the sequence and and one of the the things I, I mentioned before I'm a big fan of metaphors one of the things that I use as a metaphor with clients is this idea that there is a sequence of dominoes a sequence of dominoes that um, just as you would maybe have seen on a video or when you were a child playing with dominoes you can line them up so that when you knock over the first one it then knocks over the second the third the fourth and it can follow up a particular sequence but it doesn't always work because if the gap is too big then perhaps the domino falls but doesn't connect to the next one or what you can do is you can take a domino out and it and it just will stop halfway or you can reroute it so it should go one way but then you divert it somewhere else and these dominoes represent neural pathways these are these are the neurons that create pathways in the brain so that you can do things automatically without thinking about it which is really useful if you're breathing and blinking and driving not so useful if you're experiencing anxiety as a result of a phobia so some of the nlp techniques mess up those patterns so that although the the start of the sequence is the same it then diverts it into a different way and and it doesn't need to um end up in let's say you know fun emotions like excitement for many of my clients ambivalence is is a lovely outcome to simply be around the thing that was causing horrible unpleasant emotions and and to feel nothing you know that that's like paradise um so i use a lot of nlp and hypnotherapy and nlp many people perceive it to be a a series of techniques or models and while there's an element of truth to that it's really the um, structure of subjective experience and modeling excellent excellent so if it's if you kind of look at NLP as right one of the key questions I will ask people when I work with them is if I were you for a day what would I need to do to feel your level of anxiety and what I'm really doing there is modeling their experience so I can I can work out the sequence of dominoes so I know which ones to change uh, just to go back to that metaphor um, Many people will ask me, do I use CBT? Um, CBT stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Um, now, CBT is what's known as the second wave of behavioral therapies, the, the originators, so people like Skinner, for example, um, you know, operant conditioning, you might have remembered that um, from, you know, psychology at school. Um, CBT was the second wave of behavioral therapies and there are um, lots of innovative um, forms of what's now known as third wave cognitive behavioral therapies that link into things like mindfulness and um, different approaches. Um, ACT, for example, is a, is a different form of third wave therapy. Um, for me, you know, asking, asking me which approaches I use, um, it's kind of counter counterproductive in a way because you know if I went to the dentist and said right what tools do you use or if I went to an electrician and said what tools do you use they'd probably look at me a bit strange you know because they'd be thinking well I use whatever tools I need to get the job done uh, and that's really how I how I think um, the one technique that there have been reports of it being effective but it's not something that I use is things like havening or um, TFT so these kind of rubbing or tapping therapies I personally don't use uh, and it's not that I would categorically rule them out it's just that because I get such good results with the combination of techniques that um, I've used I've not found it necessary to use tapping techniques or, or kind of havening techniques um, although some people have reported fantastic success with them uh, it's just not not an approach I use. Um, so the main approaches that I use are hypnotherapy, NLP, and um, behavioral therapy, but mainly the CBT and the third wave therapies. Um, and, and CBT, for example, kind of looks at the mind a bit like a computer. Uh, and it says, right, you know, you, you're following these certain processes. 
Um, and, and it involves things like goal setting, you know, an incremental increase of like labeling, you know, what does a level two fear look like? What would you need to do to kind of uh, represent success in the area? Now, the, the challenge with traditional CBT is for me, it takes too long. And that's why I tend to use um, some of these other approaches because I'm known for being able to eliminate a phobia in a single session or in a single workshop. So for me, while I don't doubt that some of these approaches in CBT could be effective, for me, they take too long. So I use them tactically alongside some of these other approaches just to, to get the results a bit quicker. Um, desensitization um, essentially is this element of incremental um, exposure to the um, to the fear and it has its place I just wouldn't start there so these people that that just kind of um, you know and, and if you have a phobia um, someone either deliberately or under the pretense of helping has tried to cure you by simply showing you this thing that you fear and it makes things worse it doesn't help um, so desensitization has its place when you're feeling resourceful when we've changed the, the patterns if we can take a level 10 or 9 fear and make it a level 3 or 4 fear then you can you can then do the thing that you fear as evidence that you're over the fear and it has its place I just wouldn't start there um, immersion um, also known as flooding um, so simply you know um, facing the fear at the ultimate level uh, and there's an element of science behind this because your body can only produce adrenaline and your fight or flight what's known as the sympathetic nervous system can only produce these kind of stuff for about 20 minutes to 40 minutes and after that it simply runs out you know it's it's not something your body is meant to produce lots of therefore um, you know there's an element when people talk about flooding um, but it is distressing it's not it's not a place I would start with and in a way immersive therapy or taking action um, as I've explained with the tarantulas is a very powerful way um, as a convincer strategy um, but if I started a spider therapy workshop by getting people to hold tarantulas they would all leave the room you know it has a it has a place in the uh, in the process but I just wouldn't start with that and these innovative technologies that use things like virtual reality headsets and um, things like augmented reality devices are basically using a combination of CBT so incremental uh, desensitization um, or even flooding um, and, and again they can have their place I just don't feel like they do anything more than your imagination can already do because for people that are phobic I would say at least 70 to 80 percent of the time the, the the anxiety that they experience isn't based on what's happening in reality it's based on what's happening in their own imagination if someone has a phobia of flying for example um, they think about that flight consistently before the flight happens and they feel anxious about it if someone has a fear of spiders I had one client for example that hadn't gone in her own garden for about two years and I said why can't you go in your garden for two years and she said well that's where the spiders are which means each and every time she thought about her garden she made a big picture in her her mind's eye of her garden crawling with spiders um, so because phobias come from either a an actual stimulus or a perceived stimulus an imagined stimulus therefore imagination is all that's required to then change the sequence of those dominoes so it can't quite get to its destination um, so the, the phobia guru system the system that I've created um, doesn't use any one of these it uses a combination of approaches tailored to the individual and the online course that I've created um, has lots of these different approaches uh, when I'm working one-on-one -on -one, then I will ask lots and lots of questions so I know which ones are going to be more effective for the individual 
And when I'm doing a workshop, I tend to do a combination because I, there's going to be different people in the room that are going to respond differently to different approaches. So when it's one-on-one, -on -one, I tend to be very targeted and tailored to the individual. Uh, and if, if it's a group workshop, then I have to have a variety. And in the online course, um, I don't have the ability to ask questions and tailor the content. Therefore, the online course has every single approach that I use um, and use uses language that is more generic so that the individual taking um, that that course and the, and the downloads can make it relevant to themselves. So of course, you know, the most effective, the one that has 100% success rate is when I work one-on-one -on -one with individuals because I'm able to calibrate to them, ask them specific questions and have a feedback loop. So if something hasn't worked, I can refine my approach. Whereas um, I don't have the ability to do that with the online course. So um, if anyone does the online course and doesn't get the result that they want, they can either get a refund or in fact um, offset that amount of money, the £99, um, against the um, the cost of one-on-one -on -one therapy with me um, so that they can still, you know, get the result that they want, which is to eliminate the phobia. Um, so the key thing is um, phobias are, in my mind, optional. There was one point in my life where I was crippled by fear, anxiety, and phobias, and now I'm not. And it's because what took me months and months and years to kind of refine um, is now available for me to work with other people in a much quicker way because I've figured out what doesn't work and what does work and, and, and can tailor my approach um, depending on what type of fear, phobia, or anxiety someone is uh, experiencing. So courage is required, um, you know, is an important um, thing I would echo. Um, you know, living in avoidance, which is the opposite of courage, um, will simply mean that the fear is still there. Um, and when you act in the, you know, when you act and, and take action, to, to echo that metaphor that I said before, um, these shadows disappear very quickly. Um, and, and a lot of fear is the subjective perception of threat. And in many cases, when you step up to that, the fear disappears very, very quickly. So I'm going to end with this bit here. And that is that where you currently are is in your comfort zone. And just because something is comfortable doesn't mean it's appealing. Um, within your comfort zone, you've been able to tolerate your anxieties, to kind of cope with your pho with your phobias. Um, but there is a big difference between living and um, surviving or living and existing. And the reality is, is that when you get through even just one phobia or one key fear then what tends to happen is that your mind then has irrefutable evidence that all fears are temporary and um, there is something very exciting about breaking through a fear because your mind starts asking the question what else is possible and outside of your comfort zone is opportunity excitement adventure and it's where the magic happens. And if I could leave one thought in your mind as a result of watching this video, is that fears can become limitations. And even breaking through just one phobia can almost knock down a whole house of cards. Because what if the majority of your limitations and anxieties are rooted in one fear or one phobia? What would happen if that phobia didn't exist anymore? What's possible within your life? I hope this video has been useful. And if you want any more information, uh, you can always go back to the Phobia Guru website, which is phobiaguru.com. And there, there are several ways in which it's possible to work with me. Um, or you can do what I did and, and follow your own journey. Um, there are lots of books and resources out there um, but if you were interested in working with me um, it's possible to work with me one-on-one -on -one. 
Uh, many people um, see me in Harley Street in central London, or I also have a clinic in Elstree in Hertfordshire. Um, I work with people internationally. Um, this same microphone that I'm speaking into right now uh, enables me to do high quality um, Skype calls. Um, so I've had clients all around the world. Um, so, you know, I can work one on one with people, even if they're not based in the UK. Um, and, you know, I quite often do workshops. Um, but a lot of people are also working with me um, through my downloads. Um, and actually, you can get a lot of downloads with all these different kind of protocols and, and, and techniques, um, combination of video and audio downloads. Um, and, and because it doesn't involve my um, time in the moment, that can be a much more cost effective way of working with me. Um, but equally, this, um, this video is um, included um, in that um, download selection. So it may be that you are already working with me, in which case, um, you know, thanks for that. And, you know, let's continue on your journey to make sure that we eliminate your fears and phobias for good and take your life where the magic happens.